It is April 13, 2017. I'm in Fredericksburg, Virginia at the Friends of the Rappahannock building, and we are doing an oral history interview with John Tippett about the history of the Rappahannock River. My name is Nancy Mulroy. Sitting to my right are Matt Griffiths and Woody Walker, who may come in later and ask some questions. But I'm going to begin by asking you about your earliest experiences on the Rappahannock River. Well, I think the um, first time I, I um, came to the Rappahannock was as a teenager, uh, maybe um, 16 years old, and uh, um, I was into river, you know, it was just getting ex exploring rivers. I kind of knew that I wanted to do something with water since I was a kid, and um, and I had a, I had a two-person kayak, and uh, a friend and I put in um, on Ruffin's Pond with and the intent to uh, paddle down to um, Port Royal, which we did. But when we got to the end of Ruffin's Pond, we realized there was a 20-foot dam there, so we had to um, lower our boats down with um, some scavenged rope to get the boat over the dam and um, and then spent the um, then it spent an overnight um, floating down the Rappahannock and to get, got a sense of the, at least the tidal portion of the river and um, and I'll, I remember um, a thunderstorm coming in as we rounded the corner in the river and we made a beeline for the shore and then um, flipped our boat upside down and and huddled under that for a couple of hours until we um, uh, could uh, put up a tarp. But um, that was our, that was my first experience, and it wasn't until later that I that I experienced the 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 other river, which is really the Rappahannock above City Dock and the and the um, uh, the rapids and and everything, which is fantastic. But um, I grew up on the Potomac, which was really, really was my first my first love as a as a river, or I grew up on the Piscataway, which is um, upper tidal reaches, and then spent a lot of my childhood summers on the lower, on the lower Potomac, and literally was on the water all the time, catching crabs and um, uh, and fish, and and trying to live off the river as much as I could during the summer, and uh, and back then, you know, the crabs and oysters and 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 the fish were a lot more plentiful. It was before the oyster decline, and uh, um, but I fell in love with with rivers on the Potomac, and um, knew that I wanted to do something w with water from an early age. So you grew up in the Chesapeake Bay region. Yeah, I grew up in Maryland, um, right on the Potomac. Okay. You had mentioned a dam earlier um, on the Rappahannock. What dam was that? Oh, there's a little dam at the end of Ruffin's Pond in in Spotsylvania County, um, at the end of, at the end of Massaponix Creek. That's still there. Um, um, we didn't know about it when we put in. It surprised us. So you've described your childhood a little bit and your experiences in the natural world. Um, how would you say that those experiences have influenced your interest in the natural environment and possibly rivers? Yeah. Um, well, I think. Um, I mean, first it was just for fun, you know. I mean, I got a lot of pleasure out of being on the water, and it, and it was, and I was fascinated by the water. I was fascinated that you could go out and 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 fill up. A, when I was young, I, at the right time of the month, you know, you could go out and fill up a bushel basket of crabs in an hour, just scooping them off the surface, you know, and. Um, and I love that proximity to nature and being able to, to live off the water. And, but I was also a real geek and that I love the, I love to think about how things work and, and to, I love to tromp around in wetlands and get up to my waist in mud and, and see what, see things we could find and explore. And I think exploring was the, probably the biggest part of my childhood that, you know, led me toward water and then, and then, helped me to slowly appreciate appreciate it and I think I went went into the field because it was it was fun it was I liked it and and I developed my conservation ethic along the way it wasn't I don't think I was I didn't grow up in a family that had any particular conservation ethic um, but the more I studied what I thought what I felt was fun 
the more I developed a sense of when you know, these are these waterways are really important. Uh, oh, that thing that I tromp around in is a wetland, and it's important. And uh, and I and I grew to to develop my own you know sense of stewardship and conservation ethic, and that kind of led me to go into the field. So, where did you go for your undergraduate or graduate educations, and how were those experiences? Well, I went to undergrad at Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, and um, and I went there specifically because at the time, it was the um, one of the very few undergraduate undergraduate liberal arts schools where you could um, get a degree in environmental science. In fact, in fact, I was able to get a degree in aquatic environments as as an undergrad, um, which I thought was just really cool. And otherwise, I didn't know anything about how to choose a college I just that's just where I ended up but I but I was lucky and ended up in a place that had a fantastic environmental science program and with a strong focus toward water and um, and and it had a, um, a joint program with Duke University so um, uh, that kind of fed me into the Master of Environmental Management program at Duke um, in North Carolina and um, that was um, you know, transformative for me because I, uh, I really, th that um, is a pro was a professional degree program, a Master of Environmental Management, and it um, uh, really helped me to see what the, how I could um, turn my passion into a career and help me develop kind of the skills that, uh, and the connections that I'd need to be able to, to, to make, it a, make it a career. And while I was there, I, I got to intern um, at a couple places, and I interned on the Chesapeake Bay with a, a company called Environmental Concern on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay, um, that, and that's where I did my master's research. And um, uh, that was, um, that company was, it's half nonprofit and half for profit, and their their nonprofit side was education, and their for profit side was wetland construction and and mitigation. So I got to see in real life, you know, what some of the jobs environmental scientists can have, and uh, um, that kind of you know led me to focus on water resources as and um, and well, resource ecology was my focus and and specifically water and watershed management. So what doors did these experiences, these internships, um, these levels of education open for you uh, in terms of a career? So uh, currently you're a professor at the University of Mary Washington with environmental science. Um, how did you get there? Well, a convoluted path. Um, I'm not an academic. Per se, um, you know, I the, there was a kind of three options for environmental careers when you come out of school: uh, government, business, or nonprofit work. Um, um, business being like consulting uh, services, and so the my first job was um, was with a soil and water conservation district in um, Connecticut, so that was kind of quasi governmental. Um, and um, and I worked on implementing a watershed management plan um, through a, uh, a federal um, 319 grant through the Clean Water Act, um, and you know I I learned uh, I learned more in six months there you know real stuff, real practical skills than I think I did in you know my whole my whole educational experience. I mean it was it was fantastic learning learning environment especially the first six months, you know. Um, and then, um, but I had just gotten married and my wife and I had, had plans we, you know, to do something together. And so we spent a, we, um, after we got our student loans paid off, we um, took a, um, we decided to um, quit our jobs and spend a year in Appalachia uh, doing volunteer work. Um, and so we worked with an organization out there um, in a little town called Martin, Kentucky population 500 and um, and it worked out in the mountains um, doing a variety of things um, my wife worked in emergency assistance and 
and um, uh, helping people with um, a seed program to help them cultivate gardens. And I worked in a community health program or community and environmental health program and did all kinds of things r ranging from helping people with monitor their high blood pressure to teaching kids about environmental stuff in, at a summer camp. Um, so, but we spent a year there living together in a community of other volunteers in Kentucky, and, uh, which was a great experience for us. And then, um, and then came, and we knew that that was probably the only time in our lives we were going to have a chance to do that. So it was either do it at the beginning of our, our lives or, or get too busy and not be able to do it. So we did it early on and then came back and, and then entered into our careers. So my first job was um, back in North Carolina at Research Triangle Institute, um, which was a um, kind of a corporate side. Um, and I was a consultant in the water quality department and we provided services mainly to other gut to state state and federal government to help them um, we did a lot of research on really cool stuff um, and got to do a lot of state-of-the-art GIS work and and determining um, um, uh, doing assessments to figure out h how effective best management practices are on farms and how much the economic value of those is if you're going to trade for trade their trade the nutrients between different um, sources and a bunch of other stuff um, and I was there for about four years and um, and learned a lot but the th um, the thing about working in the private sector even though we were doing great kind of state-of-the-art work was that I felt like my work was one or two orders removed from being able to make a difference, you know, or at least me making a difference. It always, always depended on somebody else taking what I did and hopefully doing something good with it. You know, I, I'd provide the computer model, and somebody, but somebody else would have to do something with it at the state. Or, and you only got to work on what your, um, whatever the contract from the state government was, which doesn't necessarily, wasn't always the things you wanted to do or the things that would had the most potential for difference. And I really felt looking around that um, the nonprofit sector had, had probably the greatest opportunity for somebody in the environmental field who wanted to make a difference. And in particular, I, I felt like there was a real lack among the environmental nonprofit community of, of leaders who operated in a proactive fashion. Like the nonprofit community was really good at knowing what they were against but not particularly good at knowing what they were for and how, and in particular, how to make those things happen that they're for. And, and what I really wanted to do was to, uh, you know, be the environmental scientist that, that, that to, lead a, to lead a nonprofit from the perspective of environmental science and not, and not a reactive, reactionary approach. Um, and, and so I started looking for one where I, I had, um, where my my thinking matched up with the thinking of the of the of the organization, and I was fortunate enough to find that here at Friends of the Rappahannock, which is um, you know was closer to my old stomping grounds, and um, and I couldn't have been more happy to you know when I when I made that transition from the private sector to the to the nonprofit, and I never looked back, and it was um, uh, it was everything I hoped for and more and 10 times harder than I ever thought it would be too. Um, because it, uh, um, there's, when you've got, when you have so much opportunity, at li and literally, you know, in a position like this with a small organization, um, you drive to work and if you see a problem, you can put your resources on that problem that day, you know, um, and, and, but there are a lot of problems everywhere, you know, especially in a 2,700 square mile watershed. And so the challenge was um, narrowing things down, figuring out where to focus so that we didn't become a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, but uh, I kind of jumped ahead of, ahead of your question, but that was, the, uh, that was kind of my progression of from education to jobs. That was a perfect transition um, because I wanted to ask you, when you got and how you got involved with four and when you arrived with this organization, what were the most pertinent issues or 
needs of the organization that you knew you could address? Yeah. So, I mean, I came to FOR as a scientist, um, but um, F that was the that was the smallest and easiest portion of what FOR really needed. Um, and FOR was um, was a baby organization and and really um, just hanging on from financial perspective. I mean, and I was hired and they they said you know we've got enough money in the bank to cover you for six months and after that you know that's all that's that's all that exists you know and um, you're on your own and and it was and I had to figure out how to develop um, funding that was just to cover me you know we had me and a, and a part-time assistant actually when I started the, the executive director was part-time and there was a part-time assistant and so um, the biggest one of the biggest challenges for me was was um, learning how to fundraise and, and to bring in consistent funding. And in retrospect, you know, I can look back and, and the, what, really, what really helped us was, was developing, we started, as we started to apply for grants and do projects and interact with local governments and such, um, it was developing that um, perspective or reputation as an organization that that focused on science first and basing its opinions not on knee-jerk reactions, but on what does the science say, um, and that won us the respect of a lot of a lot of people, including grantors. That we're that for the first time, you know, we got our first our first um, significant grants, um, and after that, and then got on the grant treadmill, which has its own challenges, but. Um, so, so to answer your question, and the f fundraising was was big, but also the sec the second big thing was um, was having a vision uh, and and being able to cast that vision and spread it, um, and really in this case to the board of the board of the organization that that you know were people who liked the river, but they didn't necessarily have a vision for. Uh, what they wanted to see. I mean, that they weren't used to thinking about rivers in terms of watersheds, um, uh, or um, about the issues that the issues that affect a river at a watershed scale and, and water quality. It was it was more about you know what's the latest thing we need to fight that somebody may be building on the side of the river, and that's just a very small piece of managing a watershed, because whether it's built on the side of the river or not, there's still I mean, as you well know, it's you know everything drains into into the river. So, so building a vision for um, what the organization was was going to be, you know, a watershed, fo a whole watershed focus, not a Fredericksburg focus, um, a science-based decision-making process, and and in particular being proactive, not waiting for, uh, not just waiting around for somebody to propose a development that we could then be against but developing programs and the bulk of our programs that would be about getting ahead of the curve and dealing with issues like um, like stormwater management and changing the way it's done before before it happens you know so changing changing the structure of, of the changing the system so that now you know when we look back and say oh we, we changed the, the regulatory process in, in multiple counties and then at the state level you know everything that happens after that is then you know, essentially affected by what we did when we t got the got the codes changed. So to take a step back, um, you've described FOR's original and possibly not current visions um, and concerns, but can we talk about its origins and I guess the public reception to both those visions as well as how it came about? Yeah. Of course, I wasn't here in '85 when it started, um, um, and the credit really goes to um, to Bill Mix, who started uh, doing cleanups and getting people together to, to clean up the river by canoe. And it was, um, uh, and he would advertise them in the newspaper. You know, people get together for a cleanup, and I and I think it was somebody at the local local newspaper who said, "So what's what's the name of your group? You know, you're putting." You keep advertising these cleanups, 
you know, and they you know, and they said they said something like, well, why don't you call it the Friends of the Rap- Rappahannock, you know, to have a name to put down for your next cleanup, and and that's how that was born, and and then those cleanups eventually morphed into people meeting, right? As I, I think Bill has probably related, and they they started meeting in a basement of a, of a cafeteria here in Fredericksburg, an old Hot Shops cafeteria, and um, and then event- and decided to form an organization that. Um, Eventually, they chartered in, in 1985, and um, uh, um, you know, f- us for the protection of the Rappahannock River, and um, and it and it was for um, several years entirely volunteer driven, and um, uh, when Bill Mix was on the first board, and um, Marsha Keener was one of the key um, key leaders um, in the early years. In fact, Marsha kind of ran the organization out of her, it was either her bedroom or her basement, I can't remember which, but um, Marsha, you know, played a big role in the, in the leadership and in trying to professionalize the organization and have a, and build relationships with elected officials. Um, and, and she, and, um, and working on trying to get the, the first grant um, a, uh, from the, which was from the Virginia Environmental Endowment uh, in 1988, there was a challenge grant where they gave us a certain amount of money and said, um, "We're going to challenge you to develop a fundraiser to de- um, number one, and then to and then to create and to then to reach a certain membership target." So it was a challenge grant to get the organization started, and we had to the organization had to raise a concomitant amount of money with the with the first fundraiser. And the, and start building building membership logs, and that's and that's what so so in a lot of ways Virginia Environmental Endowment was the first step in in getting us professionalized, and that um, allowed the organization to hire its first staff person, uh, um, Warren Wise, who was the first executive director. Um, but um, Marsha Keener was really um, a key leader, along with Bill Mix and and um, one of the early chairs by the name of Larry Gross. So I suppose we're here today to address the original discussions on on the Andrew Dam removal. Um, So what was your what was your initial role in the Amber Dam's removal, and what kind of discussions were in place? So when I got here in 1995, you know the Embry Dam had been a an issue on the the burners at FOR since since FOR had had begun. You know there had always been an interest in um, in preserve somehow figuring out a way to get rid of the dam because it was a safety hazard. Um, a child had died on it, um, playing on it, and um, and also the the canoe the canoeists the recreational canoeists um, didn't really like having to portage around it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, but um, not a whole lot had happened. Um, uh, there was um, the, our local representative, um, but. Uh, by the name of uh, Senator Ed Houck and the and the general Assem- the ge- senator in the Virginia General Assembly, had been the biggest proponent of removing the dam. He was he was one of our partners, and he had been pushing for money and such for a long time. And the one thing that had happened by that point is um, we gotten funding to do, um, or the city had gotten funding to go in behind the dam and take samples. Right to see if the sediment was contaminated, because whenever by that point and when anybody mentioned removing the dam, the first thing that came up was no, you can't remove the dam because we ha- we've had hundreds of years of gold mining in the watershed, and um, the uh, you know there's the potential for uh, mercury um, to, um, to be in the um, which was used for for the removal of um, the removal of gold. From the sediments, there's potential that that could well be have accumulated in all the sediments behind the dam because, you know, at the head of the dam we had almost 20 feet, of, well, 17 feet of sediment, right? A lot, um, which kind of tapered out. Um, 
that had been there for a long, long time since, um, you know, 1854 when the original crib dam was built. So, um, but, um, and the contractor came in and did a bunch of um, samples and came back and the report was clean. They couldn't find any, any sediments. And so the fact that the sediments were clean was, um, was the first big hurdle that was overcome. Um, and, but FOR had been, um, everything that FOR had done up to that point was lobbying at the state level. And it was kind of uh, like um, squeezing a turnip that had already uh, had all its juice squeezed out, you know. Um, and there was, there was just no money to, there was, getting, getting the money for the study was, on, was a coup, you know. But getting the money to remove the dam just you know the more the more now I'm kind of proceeding past my arrival now I'm talking about you know at, at, uh, one of the things we started to realize is um, you know we're about three orders of magnitude off between the kind of money that exists at the state and how much money was needed to remove the dam and the and the local governments um, Spotsylvania and Stafford and you know in, in the city were simply not forthcoming with money um, they're all struggling, you know, in particular in the, at those, those, those time periods. They didn't have the money. They're struggling to buy that, build their next high schools, you know. And the thought of spending a few million dollars on removing a dam uh, just um, simply wasn't in the cards. Um, and so that's where it stood at that time, um, was, in a, was in pretty much a, a stalemate. So in terms of community support or lack of, even state support or lack of, um, who is leading both? So um, from the state, we had, we had, um, we had support, um, at, least, at least moral support, from the, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, who actually have a fish production, fish um, passage specialist on staff, Alan Weaver. Um, and so um, there was always, there was interest, um, but no money. And we had Senator Houck with plenty of interest, but you know, no ability to really move significant amounts of money out of the General Assembly, um, other than this, a study. And the local governments were somewhat ambivalent, um, ex except um, the city and Spotsy, the city in particular had a vested interest um, for the longest time in keeping things the way they were because the dam diverted water into this canal that runs behind the building here and to a pipe that that um, fed the drinking water plant. So the dam was needed for quite a long period of time because it provided the drinking water for the city. And so um, the next big thing to happen after the... Um, after the the study that cleared the sediments was um, the removal of the need for the dam because of water supply and that happened through the work of um, a fellow on city council named gordon shelton um, and gordon advocated for a new a water supply to be built on the rappahannock that um, would be a partnership between the city of fredericksburg and spotsylvania county and that would not rely on a dam on the river, but instead would use a, a model called um, a side stream skimmer, where they dam up a, a tributary, but that tributary, that watershed doesn't have anywhere near enough water for their needs. So they, do, they, they sip water from the, the Rappahannock during high flows to fill up the, the basin behind it, the side stream skimmer reservoir which is, which is um, a, a great approach, and it's now used on three reservoirs, all of the water reservoirs on the Rappahannock, essentially. Um, and that, so Mott's Run already existed as a, um, as a reservoir, but um, they worked in, um, through Gordon Shelton's work, um, working with the county, and then Hal Wiggins, who was working with the Corps of Engineers, in his regulatory position with the Corps, 
um, worked together and eventually um, came up with a plan that created a new water supply at Mott's Run by creating a pump station that would fill up Mott's Reservoir and then um, a water treatment works up there. That the, and then once that was built, the Kasi water plant, which was what the city relied on, could be shut down. It was antiquated anyway. And then that was the last formal reason for the dam to exist. At that point, um, you know, the pipe no longer, re no longer required water. The only thing the dam did at that point was aesthetic, provided water for the aesthetic benefits of the canal, which was important to a lot of people, still, still is important. Um, uh, and it was, and so the question was, you know, became, you know, what, what, what do we do with this thing? You know, and um, that, um, that was where it stood after, that was the second hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. Did I answer it? What else? What was the other part of your question? Um, I suppose, can you think of any other complications or considerations um, that for had to face um, when proposing such a project? Right, right. So, um, so what we decided to do is um, once, that, the, once that hurdle had been cleared, FOR took the lead in trying to coordinate um, all the stakeholders on the issue. And so in this room, we hosted a lot of meetings of, of multiple agencies, particularly Virginia agencies, coming together and um, uh, um, hashing out what needs to be done and uh, how much money it would cost. And, uh, you know, and we had a lot of those and they didn't particularly go very far. You know, we came up, we came up with a position statement that we wanted to see the dam removed and, um, and also that we wanted, if the dam was removed, we didn't want the sediment released. We wanted it to be um, X dredged out before the dam was taken down. Um, and, uh, that complicated matters for some people who just wanted to, the core was quite happy to, um, you know, they had said, oh, there's no big deal. You don't need to, um, uh, you can release the sediment, but we weren't going with that. I mean, this, that was at the same time when we were just launching the, the um, plans for each river basin to reduce their sediment loads and their nu nutrient loads called the river basin plans, you know, and it was, it was foolish to be, to say, okay, we're going to release the hunt, thousands upon thousands of cubic meters of sediment here at the dam while we're while we're paying farmers lots of money to keep the sand on to keep the sediment on their fields you know it, it just didn't make any sense uh, so so we said you know we even though this was one of our primary goals we said we won't support it unless this the sediment gets stretched um, so we um, and after a while we realized that we weren't going anywhere with the state um, and uh, so uh, we, um, we started reaching out and thankfully we had a, a board member and his name is Tom Van Arsdal and Tom had um, because he, he worked as a lobbyist for agriculture in his day job he had, he had connections with um, Senator Warner and Senator Warner's staff as well um, and well enough so that um, he could invite Senator Warner down to go fishing. And uh, so we began a, um, a regular process every year of having Senator Warner come down and go fishing. And, um, and we developed a relationship with him and his staff. And it was on um, one of those fishing trips um, where um, I had taken him out fishing, and we were right below Embry Dam, and and um, you know you've kind of got a captive audience, and when you got somebody in a canoe, and and I was bending his ear on a couple things while we were fishing, and and of course one of them was removing this dam that was in front of us, and and he was in a very sharp mind, and he asked a lot of really incisive questions about, you know, where's the support, what's the problem, you know, and I was telling him the the local governments, you know, every, there's not really much in the way of opposition. It's just we don't have the funding to make it happen, and um, you know, and he, and he is a sportsman, and he cared about fish, and 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 he said, you know, this is silly, you know, this dam, this dam here, and um, and you could tell he was thinking about it, and and 
we loaded the boats back on top of the van and we were coming down this this roadway or the access road that leads right right back to the friends of the Rappahannock office and um, and he kind of reached his arm over the um, the uh, seat to, uh, in the van to the back of us and he said I'm gonna take that on as a personal project those were, those were his words and lo and behold um, it was probably four weeks later that a um, that we got word that there had been an appropriation of $100,000 for what's called a reconnaissance study. And that's a very first step. I mean, that's um, $100,000 is a, is a tiny little drop in the bucket of, of what it takes for the federal government to do something. But it was a study, it was money to fund the federal, the um, Corps of Engineers to, to look at the issue and say, is there federal interest in removing the dam? And um, I think with some pushing from Senator Warner, they, de they determined that there was federal interest in removing the dam, uh, whatever, however they define federal interest, I don't know. But they spent the $100,000, which the Corps was happy to get, and they made the decision that there was federal interest. But that was the first in what became multiple hurdles of getting funding for the dam removed. And um, where this is where FOR, played a really key behind the scenes um, role that most people don't know about because really it was only a handful of us who were involved in going to Capitol Hill and um, meeting with Senator Warner as things got dicey on this project. And that happened a couple times. Um, although there wasn't much in that we had, um, we had been doing over the period um, for the prior um, seven or eight years had been doing a lot of community efforts to, so that the community was generally positive about the dam removal. So we had been doing uh, fish lifts, right, where we teamed up with the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries and would um, get a load of Friends of the Rappahannock volunteers on the far bank and they and the Game and Inland Fisheries would use their stun boat to stun fish and, um, and then our volunteers would form a line all the way around what a very long portage around the dam and then we would have the buckets come off of the um, off of the stun boat and pass them around and carry them person to person to person all the way around and then release them and the shad it was shad and, and blueback herring and occasional american shad gizzard shad and um, and then release them upstream you know so and it was making the and they would always make the front page of the region section every time we, we did a fish lift, because it was fun. And you know, it's something different. And that picture of somebody releasing the fish and letting them go upstream. And everybody kind of, who read the paper at least over the years, you know, got the impression, okay, this dam is blocking something. You know, it's blocking fish passage. And if you read the, we always made the point, you know, it's blocking roughly 700 miles of historic spawning habitat. And, and I think those efforts, and then, um, and then as things started getting, um, as we really started putting some effort into building public support, we started running a shad planking event uh, at Old Mill Park, where shad planking has a Virginia political history as an event where you, you nail shad to a plank and then put them over a, kind of a smoky fire and they, um, and they cook and all the politicians talk and do their thing. Um, so we did it, but kind of with a, um, as a demonstration really, because the health department wouldn't let us actually um, feed the shad to anybody, <laughs> um, which was kind of funny, but um, we did it as a demo and a lot of people came out just to see what shad, the old shad plankings were like. And we had bluegrass bands and stuff. And we did that for maybe three or four years. Um, um, so, and we call it the shad festival and shad planking. And you know, it was, a, it was a big thing, kind of similar to what we do for Earth Day now, um, at um, at Old Mill Park. Again, it, at, again, uh, carrying the, the drumbeat of education, right? Uh, to um, to build support. So, so by the time Senator Warner got involved, we you know we could say to him, um, we've got support from the public. Um, we we don't have opposition from the local governments, you know. Um, and you know they're nominally supportive; they just don't want to put money into it. And um, uh, and that's what he said to us. He said, he said, 
um, if you can show to me that there's that there that there's community consensus in removing this dam, then I will work on getting the funding to do it. And so that we felt that was our marching orders, and so that was actually the impetus for the shad the shad events and um, and really keeping a steady drumbeat in the media, letters to the editor, kind of building building a general positive public support about the need to remove the dam. Um, meanwhile. There was there were a lot of issues that came up behind the scenes with um, the funding potential funding for removing the dam um, because it got um, there's two pro there's two things that the federal government authorization and appropriation and you get one but then you have to still get the other and so um, there was great great news came when he got. Um, uh, I forget which ones comes first, authorization or appropriation, but one of them came, and we held a big, big press conference here, and we had um, um, both both state senators here, and um, and, uh, and we cleared out that whole room and had a had a huge press conference, and the and the head of the Corps of Engineers and such, um, but then we actually had to go the second step, and Congress had to formally make the money available, and that's where things got a little tricky. Because as it turned out, um, the, when the Corps of Engineers gets, gets involved in doing a project at a local level for a government, like removing a dam or dredging, they require cost share. You know, like the, the federal government will, will pay like 50% or 75% and the local government pays the other part. Um, but in our case, the local governments were not forthcoming with money. They didn't even, even with the federal government coming in and offering to pay 75%, the county of Stafford, city of Fredericksburg, county of Spotsylvania said, uh, sorry, we don't have the money. Um, and they complained, the state complained because the cost of the federal government doing it was, was, was probably, uh, um, I don't know, five times the amount of the cost that it would have been um, for what the state was thinking it would have cost. It's because whenever the federal government gets involved in things, the prices get jacked up really, really high. Um, so, you know, people heard that it's going to cost $8 million to remove the dam. And so so the state got indignant. So we start our, our friends at the at Game Inland Fisheries started giving us this kind of thing. Well, we could have done it for for two million, you know, and we were like, well, well, guys, um, you maybe you could have done it, but you didn't do it and you haven't been doing it. And we've been trying to get you to do it and get the money through the General Assembly and it has not forth been forthcoming. And so they were so there was a certain amount of animosity or indignance from this, our partners there that we went to the feds. Right. And then um, and then within the federal government, um, there was this problem that um, there were two problems. One, our local government wasn't going to do their share, um, and and so that led Senator Warner, who was in a in a very unique place. He couldn't have been in a better position because he was the chair of the Senate Armed Forces Committee. Okay, and the Senate Armed Forces Committee obviously controls the money uh, for all military activities, right? Um, in particular, they pass an act called the Water Resources Development Act, which controls the Corps of Engineers and all the money they get. And that comes up for renewal every so often, and it was coming up for renewal. So the senator um, uh, did what um, created a bill that said the Corps of Engineers will pay for the removal of the dam at 100 percent. And um, and and you know appropriated that money. And that got the Corps of Engineers mad um, for two reasons. Number one, um, this undermined their process uh, of, of local governments sharing, which kind of could cause a bad precedent for everything in the future. And second, it was the whole thing about Embry Dam, the money for Embry Dam coming in was a um, uh, a runaround of their system, of their actual system, because the way it normally works is Congress gives them a lump sum of money, and the Corps uses their own prioritization process to figure out the projects that should be funded within their purview. So you know they they may prioritize dredging a channel in Tallahassee as more important, right? 
and um, so they would they wanted whatever if they were going to do Embry Dam they wanted it to be subject to their own prioritization of funding you know and truth is truth be told it probably would have never come up to the top of of a funding when it's competing against keeping navigation channels open right because this is not a, really not a navigation channel right um, but when the money came through us through a senator like that this is what they call pork barrel right pork barrel politics where it's where it's meant to serve uh, it comes through a local legislator and it's meant to serve their specific needs um, and and so the court didn't like that they didn't like being told how to use money um, but but senator warner um, and, and um, Tom was there. Tom Van Arsdale was there at the at the committee meeting when he said it, and it was sent, was essentially, um, the water resources bill was coming up for vote, and the Corps of Engineers complained, and he said, "No Embry Dam, no bill." And this was huge. I mean, this was um, you know a dinky little project in the in the scheme of things nationwide that they're dealing with, um, but because this one man had took it had taken it on as a pet project, that's how it got through. So sometimes it's it's all about who you know and not about what you know or what you do. And in this case, Embry Dam simply would not have happened if Senator Warner hadn't hadn't put his foot down and said no water resources act unless this dam gets funded. The removal of the dam gets funded. That's how we were able to get the eight million dollars um, that covered it in in total with with the local governments not having to chip in money. They were finagled a deal where the land on where the that where the dam touches on either side the local governments would donate that to the process you know that was their that was their so-called contribution um which was which wasn't really anything really um because the money came the land came back to them anyway um but um he he was responsible for it we ended up um there were there were multiple times during the process where it seemed like Things were going to fall apart, you know, because of the core or the senator. The senator was wavering a little bit because, you know, he had heard some news that maybe there wasn't the that there was some some conflict and there wasn't some wasn't unanimous support. And so we would trudge up to Capitol Hill and have a meeting with him and his staff and, and make sure everything was was stable and, and and kept the train on the rails a number of times. Um, and then um, and ultimately. Um, the money, the money got appropriated, and and um, and it happened. As far as opposition, there was um, the only um, real opposition that we encountered was uh, a family who lived on the other side of the river, um, um, the Blankenbakers, who um, who were concerned that um, the explosives in the in the dam for removing the dam would damage their would damage their home. Um, and it was their dream home that they had built, and um, and they liked the view of the of the impoundment behind the dam. So um, we spent a lot of time climbing the hill and sitting on their veranda up there, talking through with them and helping them to come to some level of um, of comfort with the idea. And the Corps made a contract with them um, that they would cover it if any damage did occur to their foundation it would cover it and they inspected every single nook and cranny of their of their basement before and nothing happened um, but um, getting them on board was the was the was the one main the one main thing otherwise um, we were fortunate I think having all the you know the efforts with the community and the education um, paid off in the end, though we had very little. It was nothing compared to the conservation easement that came years later, where we encountered a very significant opposition um, that we had to do a lot to to educate and counter. Um, but Embry Dam was was a slam dunk from that perspective. The the hard part was just, was getting the funding. You had mentioned eight million dollars. Um... Nancy, I want I want to step in for just a second. Your timing. How are you for time? I'm open. Okay, because we, we had promised about an hour or so. Um, if you're okay, I think this conversation is going superb, superbly well, excellent. We're really hearing some cool things. So I know we can edit this me breaking in. I want to make sure you're good. You guys are good? Because I'm. This is, this is great. This is what we wanted. I think we should try to wrap up by around 11, if, if, if we're at that point. That's another 20 minutes or yeah. so. 
maybe about five till Nancy to give us time for some wrap up and I want to shoot a couple pictures. So does that work for you? Yeah. Okay, cool. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned eight million dollars being um, perhaps an estimated cost or was that the total cost of the project? Like how did those two, the real versus the estimated cost compare? Yeah, they did it. They did it within budget. I think. Well, it might have gone up to ten million. I'm. I'm not quite sure. There were some issues with dredging. Um, they added on, um, I, and I can't remember the details on that side. It was either it was either eight or ten. Um, when the um, the the next thing that ha that happened after the dam, you know, they they dredged as we had we had requested, but they dredged a new channel on the le on river right. Um, and the river was quite quite wide, um, but they dredged a new channel, you know, expecting the river to go back to its to its old size. Um, but when the when the dam was blown and everything and everything drained out, what we were left with was a huge um, area of unconsolidated sand and silt on river left that covered several acres, um, and it was um, not stabilizing. It was not going to stabilize. And this was this was sediment that we had really wanted removed um, anyway, and they had only removed it in the channel on River Right. So um, we pushed really hard and wrote letters to the Corps, and things got a little dice, you know, a little testy for a while. Um, but then the, the Corps finally agreed to come back and remove that sediment that's now ground sediment. It was it would have been dredged sediment. Now it's on the ground and it's five feet deep, or in some places a lot deeper, um, on the whole, all of river left. So they spend a lot of effort with the con contractors, and that's, I think, how the price may have gone up some in the end, doing um, what looked like earth moving, you know, getting rid of all that sediment. Because it was unconsolidated, sand and loose, loose stuff, it just wasn't going to, it was going to, it was washing away with every rainfall event. Um, I mean, literally, it was just calving off like icebergs calve off, you know, the ice sheet every time the, the rain came up. And so, um, you know, we really um, pushed on that to get to get that that sediment removed. So they um, brought in those mega mega excavators, you know, with the huge buckets and the huge track um, um, dump trucks, and spent um, a month out there just scooping up sediment that would have otherwise gone downstream with 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 future storm events. But there was still sediment that that obviously that that didn't get cleaned up and and the stretch of of the river between Embry Dam and and City Dock in particular uh, got a pretty pretty substantial pulse of sediment that got you know se several inches that got deposited right after the dam and it and, has, and it took a few years for that to get fleshed out and in some places it's it's has filled in holes that used to be there and it's shallower than it used to be today to come near the end of the interview um i guess i'd like to consider given your years with floor and spending the time on the rapid river and with this project, how has the river changed since you first encountered it and since the removal of Embry Dam? Um, well, right here, you know, where the dam is is no longer visible, it's um, that's a striking change, you know, um, it, and that area that used to be un that had been underwater since 1854 is now uh, a stretch of some of the best rapids on the river and really scenic um, so so that for that stretch of river it changed enormously um, otherwise not a lot um, largely because the you know we've got 31 miles of river above Fredericksburg that's in permanent conservation easement and that that um, that's not changing, um, and uh, and in the city itself, um, you know, not too much. 
So, um, have, you know, not a whole lot of changes other than that. The, the removal of the dam was probably one of the most significant ones, um, significant things that happened. I mean, we can talk about things like downstream where there's development happening on the, on the shore, you know, for retirement communities and stuff. That's, that's changing the face of the river a, a bit. Um, but, um, you know, there's been a change in the fish community. Um, we know that the, the fish are getting up now um, to um, the, the far reaches. Um, and it was just, you know, it was really amazing. I think it was year after or two years after the dam came down and got a call from um, a friend of mine at the Soil and Water District who was standing at the gate, the water gate to Lake Pelham in Culpeper. And he said, I'm standing here at the gate and there's, it's, it's, it's all these fish bumping up their, bumping their heads against the gate, you know, trying to, trying to get into the lake. And he said, I've never seen this in my life. You know, this is, these are, this must be the fish that have been, you know, wanting to come upstream, you know. And uh, of course, all the, the game and the fisheries have confirmed that as, as they've done the, done the sampling. I mean, it took longer than they expected for a lot of the fish to get upstream, um, but but they're getting there. And how that this ecology is going to play out, the change in that is, is still is still something to be seen. You know, it's still working out. What are your current and future hopes for Front of Organic and for Organic? Well, for the organization. You know, I think the most important thing is that it can continue to be a, a proactive, a proactive force for the river. Um, that the organization keeps its sights on um, the issues that are affecting the water quality of the river, and get in front of them, and and try and be a force for positive change. Um, you know, for the longest time, that's been that's been stormwater, and that's where I put a lot of my emphasis. You know, there's issues coming up, you know, like like fracking that are, that are another issue where FORS has been out in front in front of the issue, and uh, so um, maintaining a, I think, and I would say this for any nonprofit, is to maintain a strong vision of what you want to be, and focus on that, and be careful about trying to become everything to all people, because it's really easy for an environmental group, a group that is in the environmental arena to want to start being all things environmental. And, and I think what's helped us at FOR is to, um, and sometimes, you know, it's been hard for people to hear this, but um, we have to keep a relatively tight, tight close, um, you know, it's almost like having a vision restrictors on um, that, that, that our, our role is the river um, and um, thing and or things that relate to the river and um, we do that because there is nobody else focusing on the river and 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 it, you can very easily become um, spread out into just becoming a generic environmental group and the, and the challenge with that is when you have limited staff resources you end up being thin across a lot of areas instead of deep in a couple areas and so um, I, I that's one of the things I hope that FOR continues to do is to be um, to be deep and focused on specifically on issues that relate to the river. Um, and um, what was the other half of the question? Um, the future hopes for anything. Both the river and organization. I yeah. That. Yeah. Well, um, that's that was for the organization. For the river, I think. Um, There's, there's, we're at a, we're at a positive, potential positive tipping point with the bay and the river, as, as, decades of work, and investment in getting nitrogen and phosphorus down, are starting to pay off, and all of a sudden in the past three years, um, oysters are coming back, and that's like the canary, and, um, and once those oysters come back, we're going to have a positive feedback loop. That, that cleans up water and gets more oysters, which cleans more water, which gets more oysters. And um, so I think one of the best things what, that we can do is, is, um, is facilitate a healthy recovery of those of a shellfish in, in, in the Rappahannock 
because probably more than any single thing um, that, that will help the estuary um, reestablish its ecology and um, uh, concurrent with that is is making sure that we continue to build a constituency for the river and um, because and make sure that this organization is the place where people go when they want to, when they care about the river um, from the headwaters to the to the mouth of the river that um, that FOR is the one that's there leading um, when it comes to restoration and education and advocacy. Matt or Woody, do either of you have questions that you would like to have something to them? No, thank you. Okay. Well, Sarah, thank you for your time. Um, are there any last remarks? I'm glad you're doing this. Thank you for inviting me.